guys, Mr. Klein here. Uh, chapter 10, Lesson 3, the last lesson in this chapter, uh, Absolute Age Dating. Uh, it's the follow-up to our previous lesson on relative age dating. Let's get started. Well, by the end of this lesson, you will be able to answer the following questions. Number one, what does absolute age mean? And number two, how can radioactive decay be used to age date rocks? Now, we talked about in class last time, we talked about the difference between relative and absolute age, especially with uh, relative age... Uh, with, in terms of rocks, how, you know, layers with superposition, ones on the bottom are older than the ones on top. But the numerical age, the exact age in any years, is absolute age. If you're an 8th grader in my class, you're either 13 or 14, pretty much. And so that's your absolute age. I, of course, am a bit older. And some teachers are even older than me. <clears throat> anyway, and... But what helps us with rocks is we can't go and find a birthday for them or anything like that. Rather, we need to use scientific principles in order to determine this age. And so what we see is scientists have found that radioactivity, okay, the principle of radioactivity uh, and process involving with that can be used to help determine the absolute age of rocks. Now, all radioactivity is, it sounds really scary, you know, movies and things like that show radioactivity for monsters and zombies and things like that. But anyway, radioactivity, all it is is the release of energy from unstable atoms. Okay, atoms that do not have a stable state and they're trying to get stable. They're trying to fall apart and get to the point where it can't. Okay, and so usually what we see in radiation are two types of radiation. One is actual energy released, okay, photons and, and energy and waves and things like that, uh, uh, electromagnetic waves like that, uh, where also we'll have particles released. And that's particles being released by radioactive atoms is what we look for in absolute age dating. Now, before we get into that, let's bounce through real quick a review of atoms. And I know we've already talked about this this, this year, but the notes are in here. And plus, people watching this on YouTube for the first time might need to know what an atom is. Now, an atom... It's the smallest part of an element that has the properties of that element, or the smallest complete unit of matter around. Now, an atom has a nucleus that's the center, and it contains protons and neutrons in there. And surrounding this nucleus are other particles. These particles have a negative charge. Those are what we call electrons. Okay? And all atoms of the same element, whether it's an iron element, a uranium element, a neon element, so on and so forth, always have the same number of electrons. Okay, I'm sorry, not electrons, protons. No, they, they, atoms will have different numbers of electrons, and those, when they have an unbalanced charge, will, of course, form an ion. But what we're concerned with in terms of radioactive and radiometric, uh, radioactive decay and radiometric dating is the number of uh, neutrons. And the nuclei of atoms of the same element can contain different numbers of neutrons. And atoms of the same element that contain different numbers of neutrons are what we call isotopes. Yes, you remember that, isotopes. So let's talk about isotopes. Right before we get into that, let's look at a nice balanced carbon atom. You see in the nucleus, that's right here. It's got six neutrons and six protons. The protons have the positive charge. Neutrons have no charge. And orbiting it, we have uh, six electrons. So let's talk about isotopes and radioactivity. Now. Isotopes that are nice and content with their states, the number of neutrons, the number of protons, and the number of electrons, is what we call stable. Okay, They are stable isotopes. And isotopes, however, not all of them are stable. Some of them that are not stable are what we call radioactive isotopes. Okay, They release radioactive particles. And during radioactive decay, an unstable element naturally changes into an element that is stable. What will usually happen, especially for uh, isotopes of smaller elements, is that it will just lose uh, neutrons. Especially in larger elements with isotopes that are unstable, actually the neutrons will release and actually grab elect uh, protons, rather, and they will both be released. And because protons are being released, the element itself actually changes, which we'll talk about later on when we talk about carbon... Uh, after, after we talk about carbon testing, we'll talk about uh, uranium lead testing. Anyway, let's talk about these two elements. The unstable element that undergoes radioactive decay is what we call the parent isotope. Okay, The parent isotope, it's the first one. It's the one that's unstable. Okay, And it goes through radioactive decay. It loses particles. It, lose, it might lose just neutrons. might use, lose neutrons and protons. And once it gets into its uh, stable state, that's what we call the daughter isotope, okay? 
parent-daughter relationship. If you remember that, some of that stuff from life science also. Okay, uh, the parent-daughter relationships. Now, let's go ahead and let's look at this. Okay, it's an example of radioactive decay. This is alpha decay. So what will end up happening is here's your parent isotope. It's unstable. And it'll release alpha particles. In this case, it's neutrons and protons. Okay, and because it releases that, its actual chemical properties change to become a different element. Whenever we talk about carbon decay, we're talking about it only using uh, neutrons, so its actual element does not change. Now, radioactive decay occurs in different rates for different isotopes. However, the decay rate for a particular isotope is always constant. It decays at a constant rate. It loses alpha particles at a constant rate. So in other words, what can happen is for each rate, what can happen is we can measure in a substance the amount of daughter isotopes and the amount of parent isotopes. And we figure out a proportion. And an inver this is a very important term, especially in nuclear physics, but also in terms of us for absolute age dating, is that the half-life Okay, it's more than a game involving a dude named uh, Gordon Freeman with a goatee and a crowbar. Okay, if you're my age, you played Half-Life in high school. Okay, if you got older brothers, sisters in college, they might have played Half-Life too. Okay, it's a science fiction game, but it's based on nuclear physics being used in a science fiction story, and that's where they got the name from it. So Half-Life. This is an important term. Half-life is the time necessary for half of the parent isotopes to decay into daughter isotopes. So for example, if you have a kilogram's worth of, let's just say, uh, uranium, and at the end of its half-life, okay, you'll have half a kilogram or 500 grams of uranium, and then you'll have 500 grams of the daughter isotope, daughter particle, which is actually lead. Now, after two half-lives, of course, half of half is, of course, one quarter. That's correct. One quarter of the original parent isotopes remains. Then after a third half-life, what's one half of one half of one half? Well, one quarter and one half is, of course, one eighth, and it goes on and so forth. And here's a handy chart for you to check out. And not only that, is it looks at just the relationship of parent and daughter isotopes. If you look right here, this point right here is your half-life. Okay, it has 50% parent isotopes, 50% daughter isotopes. After a second half-life, it is only 25%. After a third, it's 12 and a half. That's 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth, so forth. Okay, of the parent isotopes and then going up are the daughter isotopes from there. And if you notice about this, this proportion remains pretty much at a constant rate. Okay, the line goes at a constant rate. So. Relationship of parent and daughter isotopes, there you go, half-lives. Now, because a half-life is constant, it allows us to determine, within a reasonable error, the ages, absolute ages of objects. Okay, so, radiocarbon dating uses isotopes of carbon-14 to determine the age of once living organisms. Now, it's important to know when you see this number next to next to the element that's telling you it's an isotope okay carbon 14 and if you excuse me i have a new slate that i'm using okay equals 6 protons okay plus 8 neutrons because it has 8 neutrons and 6 protons it has more neutral uh, particles than it does uh, positive ones, so therefore it is an isotope of it. Now, the important thing to know is as long as an organism lives, the amount of car carbon-14 remains in it is constant. We always, as long as we're alive, the amount of carbon-14 we have in an organism is the same. You and I were alive, we still have the same amount of carbon-14 in us. It does not change. Okay. However, when we die, Carbon-14 starts breaking down into carbon-12. Carbon-12 obviously means 6 protons plus 6 neutrons. Okay, These 6 protons and 6 neutrons is a balanced, uh, is a, an isotopic complete balance. So it's like what you would see in the periodic table. You would only see 6 uh, protons, 6 neutrons, 6 electrons. Uh, 
And radiocarbon dating involves comparing the amount of carbon-14 to the amount of, and I just gave it away already, carbon-12 in an organism that has died. And because the radioactive decay is constant, we can figure out the point where it becomes 50-50 between carbon-14 and carbon-12. And the half-life of carbon-14 is only 5,730 years. So for things that are really, really recent, uh, radiocarbon dating is really, really useful because, you know, we can determine the half-life. Oh, look, 5,730 years. That's, you know, that's half-life. We can figure that out. And, however, after about 50,000 years, after an organism has died, the carbon-14 has decayed so much that it can't be measured. So radiocarbon dating is only useful to about 50,000 years in the past. So the Ice Age, Ice Age things like woolly mammoths, saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, giant sloths, things like that, we can use carbon dating to determine their age and determine it pretty closely within a margin for error. Okay, And so this is how the carbon dating process works. For example, this is from a university, uh, Waikato, which is in New Zealand. And this is how they would use to uh, find the age of a moa, which is a giant flightless bird. So they find the bone. Okay, They clean it up. They take a small sample and they grind it down into a dust. Okay. And they put uh, different treatments on it. They do acid tests, they electrify it, so on and so forth, all sorts of these tests. Then it's freeze-dried. It's dried real quickly, and there's no moisture in it. Then it adds, adds chemical reactions to it. And what it does is all the carbon atoms present will be combined with the chemicals to form an organic a molecule we call benzene. So the benzene is formed. Okay, It adds a catalyst, a scintillator to it, and it's put into a machine. It's what we call a liquid scintillation spectrometer. It's a really fancy name. And it goes through the process. And afterward, it starts, it counts the number of radioactive decays occurring per minute. So it'll count the neutrons being lost by the uh, carbon isotopes. Okay, and so the computer takes all this data, puts it in, and spits out a date within a reasonable uh, margin of error being sampled. So that's how the carbon dating process. We take a sample do chemical things to uh, put chemical reactions to it, put it in a machine, count the radioactive decay going on, and we use it to determine the age. But, like we figured, carbon-14 dating is only useful because it's organic. All organic things have carbon in it, so it can't be used to date rocks. I mean, you know, rocks, if they don't have carbon, we can't use carbon-14 dating. So, we have to use other things. For example, radioactive isotopes are most likely to be trapped in igneous rocks uh, for various reasons, which we don't really need to go into. But essentially, igneous rocks can be dated by comparing numbers of parent and daughter isotopes. Okay, So we use igneous rocks and we use different dating techniques. And there's like seven or eight different dating techniques to determine uh, the absolute age of rocks. And But we're going to look at one right here. Radioactive isotopes are not useful in dating sedimentary rocks, mainly because sedimentary rocks are made of older rocks. Okay, They are rocks that have been ground down through erosion and weathering, and it's been deposited, it's been compacted, it's been cemented. So these rocks will give you different decaying things. So radioactive isotopes are oftentimes just found in igneous rocks because they come from molten rock and they dry, and it's pretty much in a quote-unquote pure form. So to date old rocks, scientists use radioactive isotopes with long lives. Uh, for example, what it is is they'll use uranium, uranium lead dating, that is UPB dating, and because uranium PB has an isotope of a couple billion years, okay, so because of that, we can use that to find the dates of really old rocks. And because of, and because of this, uh, and I'm, and because of this, we can determine the uh, half-lives of the radioactive isotopes, and we can also determine the age of these rocks. And of course, when I just said uh, uranium has a couple billion uh, half-life, I didn't mean that. It's about, I think, 507 million years just offhand. Okay, um, uh, so you know it's a really long time. And because anyway, so because of this, we're able to go through the dating. We found that the oldest rocks on Earth, more or less, are about four billion years old. So the absolute age of the Earth, based right now on scientific processes that we know of, is 4 billion years old. It's pretty old. And whenever we talk about geologic time, we'll see that humans' time on Earth is really, 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 really short in comparison. Okay, so let's wrap this up. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to answer these questions. We know that absolute age means the numerical age of an object in years. Now, 
How can radioactive decay be used to date rocks? Okay, well, rocks and objects can be tested for samples of radioactive particles. The ratio of parent isotopes to daughter isotopes is measured, and that ratio is used to determine the absolute age of the object. So there you go, radio, uh, absolute age dating. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know on YouTube, anything like that. Anything in class, feel free to send me an email or anything like that. Thanks for listening.